because of your reaction time. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, we're going to uh, continue on looking at both the passive properties, and I left you with a question at the very end of the last lecture about how you would actually determine at rest why the uh, membrane potential was closer to the uh, potassium equilibrium pot uh, potential or the reversal potential for potassium as opposed to the other ions. And at, um, at rest, we really look at uh, potassium, sodium, as well as chloride. And why is it closer to the um, equilibrium potential for potassium? And that's what we left with. I'll go over that again with you today. Um, and then we'll continue on a little bit with some of the passive properties of neurons and then we'll jump into some of the active properties of neurons and as the name suggests we'll get into some of the action potentials today. If you don't mind I'm probably going to um, try finishing off today's lecture at around um, 3.30 to 3.40 depends, depending on how things go. I've left all of the solutions for most of the problems with you at the end. I'll give you a little bit of a head start on it. Um, I will stick around if you have any other questions but if, um, if you feel that you're okay with some of the calculations that I was planning to take up in the second half, um, you're free to go. Uh, no need to hang around. I will take up the questions again on Monday as well, so um, I don't think there should be any issues there. And it looks like the weather's getting, um, it's turning just a little bit nasty outside, so I don't want you to get stuck in the uh, snow going home. So we looked at these electrogenic pumps in the last lecture to set up these concentration gradients that allow for the diffusion only if these leak channels are open. And in most cases, they're leak channels because they're open. And this conductance of charge across the membrane was sort of where we stopped. And we looked at how we would actually go in and start looking at these reversal potentials for one particular ion related to the reversal potential or the equilibrium potential for, for one species of ion at a time. We then combined all of those together to take a look at the uh, resting membrane potential looking at sodium, potassium, as well as chloride, and we used the combination of Nernst plugging him into the Goldman equation to calculate the resting membrane potential. And we saw that it was relatively close to the resting membrane potential um, or the reversal potential as we calculated it through the Nernst equation for potassium. But at rest, when nothing else is actively going on, and this goes back to that question, how do we know which of these leak channels actually um, are responsible for the resting membrane potential? What are these resting or leak conductances that make up the majority of that uh, resting membrane potential? And so this was, this was one of the big conundrums. People were able to do um, various forms of electrophysiology into the late 1800s and into the early part of the 1900s. And one of the first individuals that actually tried to do this in both muscle preparation as well as in nerve preparation was Julius Bernstein back in 1902. And one of the things that he postulated was because it was so close to the potassium equilibrium potential or the reversal potential for potassium that Potassium should be the ion that dominates. It should be this leak that allows for the resting membrane potential to sit at around minus 65. And so one of the things that he did was exactly the types of things that we did in, in the last sort of experiment. His preparation was a little bit different. So he, he had a bath preparation and he would be measuring from a particular cell, whether it was a muscle cell or a neuron, and he started measuring the resting membrane potential and uh, on the extracellular side, he started to change the concentration of the extracellular solution. So um, he only looked at potassium to begin with, and it was one ion at a time. And one of the things that he did was he did a step increase um, in the pota extracellular potassium concentration. So he started off with 3.5 millimolar um, potassium in the extracellular bath, and he saw that it didn't really change the resting membrane potential. He increased that to 10 millimolar potassium. And again, this is a passive property. There are no, um, there, there is no active change in the membrane potential that you are causing. This is all a result of the change that you're seeing here. So by increasing this to 10 millimolar, you have caused a depolarization. It's getting closer towards zero. And again, by going up to 20, you cause an even bigger depolarization. 
And eventually, by changing it to 450 millimolar, millimolar potassium on the extracellular um, bath solution, he was able to get it um, to uh, go toward zero. And so by doing this, he was able to uh, find these really predictable changes that regulated the membrane potential. It was all passive. He was only changing the concentration gradients. And by changing the concentration gradients, he was able to determine that the passive properties of this uh, rusting membrane probably uh, was the result of potassium. Now, he also wanted to verify whether or not this, was, this statement was true. If potassium is one of the dominant um, ions, he also had to go and check to see if the same sorts of things happen with sodium. And by doing exactly the same types of experiments with the same preparation, instead of changing the extracellular concentration of uh, potassium, by doing exactly the same thing, not changing anything else, looking only at the um, passive membrane properties, um, by changing it uh, to 100 millimolar, 200 millimolar, and the scale is a little bit different, but the idea is exactly the same, even up to um, one molar, he wasn't able to change the resting membrane potential very much. And so one of the things that he knew is that the lead conductance for potassium, this channel that allowed for the free flow down its concentration gradient of potassium is what accounted for the resting membrane potential. It was really that particular ion that was responsible. Uh, sodium wasn't really involved um, to a large extent in the rusting membrane potential. And in fact, other individuals later on, Hodgkin and Huxley and others, started to go around and um, re-examine this whole phenomenon later in the 1950s. And they were able to basically confirm Bernstein's hypothesis that at rest, the passive properties, the leak channel properties of potassium, and by changing the concentration gradients, um, really allowed for the rusting membrane potential to be calculated um, using that particular equation. In a simplified version, because remember, you have to have open channels uh, related to conductance. So you need, you need something for it to traverse this uh, biophysical barrier, this, bi, uh, uh, this phospholipid bilayer. There's no other route of access for these um, different ions. And by doing so, he was able to show that the two dominant ions that were involved in the uh, resting membrane potential were both potassium as well as sodium. And at rest, the conductance for potassium is relatively high and the conductance for sodium is relatively low, accounting for why it was closer to the equilibrium potential or the reversal potential for potassium and why by changing the extracellular concentrations, he wasn't able to change the resting membrane potential. Next Friday, in the different tutorials that you'll be given using computer simulations, you will be doing something similar to this, um, changing the extracellular concentrations and seeing if you can actually change the resting membrane potential um, in, the, in a particular type of uh, neuron. Do you guys have any questions on this before we go on? Um, just as a note, because you'll need to know this later on when we go through some of the um, different problem sets, um, when we talk about how a, an ion can traverse this impermeable uh, phospholipid bilayer, we use this biophysical constant known as G or conductance. And it, this is measured in Siemens or Pico Siemens, uh, depending on how it's written. But this is uh, really a property of whether or not a channel is open or not. And you need, even if you have this massive concentration gradient, if there's no channel that's open, there's no way for this to go through. And so the leak channel that's open for potassium is incredibly important here. So the Goldman equation, then the modified Goldman equation that I just showed you in that previous um, diagram that only looked at sodium and potassium, and we haven't looked at chloride at all, we haven't looked at um, calcium at all, but that really simplified version of the Goldman equation only applies when the membrane potential is not changing. Okay, We can artificially change the concentration gradients and we can um, cause the membrane potential to change that way as a result, but overall, we're not um, causing any membrane potential change, and that will become important a little bit later on. When, when the neurons start to signal, as you know, um, this starts to generate synaptic potentials as well as action potentials. The rules that we just looked at are no longer going to apply because the membrane potential during these active processes 
moving from a passive, this is what happens at rest, to what happens during an action potential, the membrane potential is going to be constantly changing. And here's an example of a typical action potential that gets generated. Um, just out of curiosity, there, is, there are two traces that are shown here. Um, this trace that's shown up at the top here, and this is the recording that you would get from a cell or a nerve cell or a muscle cell um, that you are recording from. And th this is the membrane potential change that you are measuring down here. And you can see action potentials are being generated. So here's an action potential. One is here, etc. Uh, what what is happening here? So we are causing a depolarization event, and so we are taking the resting membrane potential. We are causing it to depolarize. It is a uh, rectangular uh, square wave function where we rapidly depolarize straight up, and we maintain this depolarization all the way through. And we are recording from the neuron as we do so, and as we do so, we are generating all of these action potentials. And this becomes important, and this actually allows us to be able to determine what type of cell we have. For example, by looking at the patterning and the frequency of the action potentials in relation to a depolarization of the membrane, we can actually see whether or not um, we have a pyramidal cell or where, whether or not we have a, a different type of interneuron. I'm not sure the movie is going to play, to be quite honest, but we'll see. I think it's okay. It's not, it's not really that important. It's more to demonstrate that um, you can actually measure these types of changes by doing these square wave pulses. Um, if we were to take a look at a different cell, so I, I'm hoping that you'll kind of remember what the overall pattern was. If we do exactly the same thing, the duration, the time down here on this axis, on the x-axis, is relatively the same. We do the same step depolarization now in this type of cell. Um, do you think we have more action potentials than we had in the previous diagram? I'm hoping it's pretty obvious that we have many, many more um, action potentials that are being generated. In fact, by doing these types of step depolarizations where we go from resting membrane and we depolarize it rapidly toward threshold, um, and again, the key point here is that we have to be near threshold, and hopefully that will become a concept that is second nature to you. We need to be near threshold for one reason. What, what kind of channel do we have to open up? voltage dependent channels and that will become important in a moment and this will tell us for example just by looking at the patterning of the um, different action potentials that get generated by the same type of step depolarization the type of uh, neuron that we're recording from so an interneuron what what type of neuron is that Do you guys know what kind of neurotransmitter it releases or what an interneuron represents so I guess from the basics are the two, do the two have the same firing pattern? The one that I showed you earlier, it has the same pattern as this one here. Yes, no, different, right? So a pyramidal cell, the first one I showed you, and the response that I just showed you right now have very different properties. A pyramidal cell, if you find it in the cortex or hippocampus, do you guys remember what type of cell that is? What type of neurotransmitter does it normally release? So what neurotransmitters do you know? Glutamate, okay. What other types do you know? GABA, okay. Any other ones that you know, neurotransmitters? So there's serotonin and other neuromodulators. So if you were to guess a pyramidal cell, is it a glutamatergic excitatory neuron or is it a GABAergic neuron? So glutamatergic, you guys are good, great. Um, and so this inhibitory interneuron uses GABA. And so sometimes we want to be able to stimulate and cause spiking activity in this inhibitory neuron. And simply by looking at the biophysical active properties of that neuron, we are able to determine its phenotype. We can tell if it's an interneuron or if it's a pyramidal cell. So there are a couple of things to think about during today's lecture, which I'll also take up with you on Monday as well. And some of it relates to a theoretical concept. Some of it might, might be things that you might be able to answer um, right now. So what, what types of things determine how quickly the potential changes in response to a stimulus? And we'll get into some of the biophysical properties in a few moments. 
And will a synaptic current always produce a similar change in the membrane potential regardless of the size of the neuron? And it's a bit of a trick question and, and something that you will answer more definitively um, in next week's tutorial on Friday. And what determines whether a given stimulus will be subthreshold? And what does that mean for you? When I say it's subthreshold, am I going to get an action potential or not? No action potential is subthreshold or super threshold. So what, what determines that, do you think? So if we depolarize enough to activate these voltage-dependent sodium channels, again, start thinking about things in that way. And how do neurons generate their uh, rapid electrical signals, and how can they be conducted along these long distances? And that will be covered in the next class, um, but you should be thinking about that as well. I know there are some extra things on this particular slide, but I wanted to include them on here, um, and I'm hoping that you'll have the time to be able to um, copy some of this down, and I'll also read some of that back to you. So when we are looking at those leak channels and those passive properties that we just looked at, simply by changing the concentration gradient, as long as there is a leak channel that is open, it will change some of the, um, the voltage, um, sorry, the membrane potential across that cell. And a lot of this is due to some of the pro passive properties of that biophysical membrane that is impermeant to the particular um, um, ion, whether it's membrane resistance that we'll talk a little bit more about or membrane capacitance. These are the, these are the overall properties that determine how quickly a neuron is going to respond to a given type of stimulus, whether we're directly manipulating it through injecting a current, so we can inject positive current um, or positive ions into a cell and cause it to depolarize, or we can do it um, electrically, um, or we can uh, stimulate another cell to activate this. How quickly it responds is really due to these two properties, the resistance as well as the capacitance. These are unique and constant in that particular um, type of neuron. They are the types of things that allow us to differentiate between an interneuron, GABAergic inhibitory interneurons, and um, glutamatergic excitatory um, pyramidal cells. These are constant. They can't change. We can't do anything to change them. Um, they're built into the biophysical properties of the membrane. I'll also talk today a little bit about in the same cell. So at rest, we have all of these passive properties that allow for the resting membrane potential and other things to occur. But the same cell, the same neuron, even though we can't change the resistance or capacitance, can change it the way in which it responds when it starts to depolarize. And that is a property of the voltage-gated ion channels. What types of um, voltage-gated voltage ion channels that it contains? So how do we start going about um, doing all of these different types of recordings and everything else when we start looking at some of these biophysical properties? And this will become important. You'll need to understand this part, which is fairly simple. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know, and I'll be happy to um, stop and um, give you uh, a more detailed explanation if you need one. Usually we have two different electrodes that we are using to do these types of recordings. So when we say that the membrane is starting to depolarize, for example, how do we know that it's depolarizing? <coughs> so we have two different electrodes that you see here. One is a bath electrode, so it doesn't sit on the cell that we're recording from, it sits in the solution. And it is known as a reference electrode because we are always comparing the um, two different environments. We are comparing the environment out here in the bath relative to what is going on inside the neuron. And this provides us with a reference. So when both of these recording electrodes, uh, sorry, when both electrodes, the recording electrode and this um, bath electrode are sitting outside in the bath together, is there going to be a potential difference? Is there going to be any difference that the two different electrodes are going to be encountering? It's in a bath. No, absolutely the same. So there'll be zero potential. So there's no electrical potential difference. I then take that um, recording electrode. I have it hooked up to an amplifier because these are really, really small um, voltages. And I hook it up to an amplifier and an oscilloscope. And then I take that electrode and I slowly move it toward a cell. I touch the cell and I might actually be able to insert it into the cell. And as soon as I do, the environments become different. They're no longer the same. There is going to be a difference in 
the voltage from the um, environment outside uh, in the bath versus inside inside the cell. And so this is what you are seeing happening here. At zero millivolts, where are the two electrodes? They're both in the bath. And now, as I move it um, here, and I've inserted it inside the cell, you'll see that the membrane, uh, you'll see that the uh, potential difference that you see immediately drops. It goes down toward the resting potential of the cell. And as we've been mentioning, it's usually around minus 65 millivolts. And this is how we do that original resting membrane potential. Do you guys have any questions about that? Again, keep in mind that you're measuring the potential difference. Both of them in the same environment, there is no potential difference. The ionic concentrations in both environments around both electrodes are identical until you move it into an environment, in, in this case inside the cell that is different, and then you can measure a difference in voltage that way or a potential difference that way. If we were to examine this on a um, longer time scale, if we were to blow up that um, time scale a little bit more, or see it in slow motion, if you will, um, one of the things that we would see, if we injected a current like this, and we were also, um, so we inject a current um, into the cell, and as we inject a current, that square wave pulse that we saw before, and we were at simultaneously measuring the membrane potential of the same cell, one of the things that we would see is that it is not a square wave. It is not this sort of rapid drop off, okay? If we were to expand that time scale, we would see that there was a brief period of time, um, half a millisecond or so, where it actually has to play catch up. There are some biophysical properties of the membrane that account for this slow rise as well as this decay. At this point here, am I still injecting current into the cell? I, I'm not, but the cell is still in a slightly depolarized state before it comes back down to the resting membrane potential. Why is there this lag? And again, this lag, how quickly it um, depolarizes and how quickly it repolarizes are really due to the biophysical constraints on the um, phospholipid bilayer as well as other proteins that are embedded into that particular membrane that you are doing the recording from. Now you don't have to worry about all of the different things that you see on here. It turns out that this slow lag, and you'll you'll actually experimentally manipulate these um, in a computer simulation on Friday of next week. You will see that we have a time constant, and you'll see that it's related to the resistance as well as the capacitance um, of the membrane. And this gets back into Ohm's law and you'll see why this is important in Ohm's law a little bit later on. And the other thing to make note of, as, a, as a, um, an overall byproduct of the uh, resistance and the capacitance that is unique to this neuron, that is unique to the uh, membrane that we are recording from, we also have this time constant. Remember I told you that how quickly we can raise things up to threshold really determines how much activity we might be able to generate. And this time constant, um, 1 over E, uh, 1 over um, uh, E is equal approximately to 63% of the final uh, uh, change in the membrane potential that we can see. And so how quickly it gets up to 63% of its final value is also a product of the uh, resistance and capacitance of the membrane. And this accounts for how quickly it takes or, or how much time it takes to get up to its final uh, resting uh, membrane potential and how quickly it comes back down from that level as well. So again, all of this is related to the membrane resistance. So this, this will affect the magnitude, the overall size of the electrical signals that we see. And this goes back into um, Ohm's law, which is again, uh, simply put, the voltage is uh, the current times the resistance or the membrane resistance that we're seeing. So if two different neurons that we are recording from receive the identical synaptic current, the responses that we see, whether or not it depolarizes, the delta V that we would see, um, really depends on how much resistance is found in that particular cell. So even if we have that same square wave pulse that I showed you earlier, whether it's the glutamatergic pyramidal cell, and we give the same square wave pulse to the, um, the inhibitory interneuron, 
that current might be identical, but the change in membrane properties that we see are is really a function of the resistance. So it tells us a little bit about the resistance. The cell that has the higher input resistance will experience the larger change or the um, delta V uh, M that we saw earlier in the membrane voltage. And as a general rule of thumb, what does that mean in the real world? What it means is the larger the neuron, the bigger the neuron, the greater its membrane surface area usually is. So it makes sense. It's a larger neuron. It usually has a larger surface area. As a, as a result of that, it has a lower, it has a lower input resistance. Um, and so there will be more of these resting channels to be able to conduct these ions. And so the excitation will be a direct result of this. We'll do this twice. Next week, um, I'll review this from a mathematical standpoint. We'll go through an example of this. And I just wanted to introduce how we're going to go through that on Monday's lecture. You'll see exactly the same thing in your tutorial on Friday as well. And you'll have a better appreciation for channel density, the size of the neuron, and how easily it can be excited, um, et cetera. So the other biophysical property, the passive property of the uh, membrane that we can measure is really the membrane capacitance. So it will prolong how long it takes for that electrical signal um, to occur. And you'll see an example of this in, in next week's tutorial as well. So the magnitudes of these subthreshold changes um, resemble a the behavior of the resistor, but the time course actually will change. And again, you'll get some examples of this. Um, the one thing, and I'll probably forget next week, if you guys can remember to do this, next Friday, um, you won't be in this room, you'll actually be down the hall. Uh, I know you guys have a Facebook uh, group. Um, oftentimes what's more useful for you, you will have the opportunity to do a screen capture. If you guys can uh, share some of your data, it's often easier to go back and um, share like what the um, actual screen grab looks like when you go through some of these different um, types of exercises. And each of these points will actually be recapitulated in the exercises that you'll get next Tuesday. So if you have a USB key, it's a good idea to bring it, save it onto your USB key, uh, and then share the data, and it'll, it'll make a little bit more sense. Part of this is related to the fact that the current that we're injecting, that we're trying to get across that biophysical membrane, has to charge up the capacitors inside that membrane, um, and then it will also flow across that resistor. And I think most of you have seen the circuit diagram that is on the next slide, and when that, um, current injection stops, part of the reason why we see that downslope after the current stops is because this capacitor discharges, it releases the charge that it has stored up, and you'll see it starting to discharge in that decay state that we saw a little bit earlier on. So you'll go back and you will review um, the biophysical properties, the resistance, capacitance um, of the different um, neurons that you will examine next week in the tutorial. And in addition to that, you'll go through some of the um, changes in the extracellular and uh, ions that we will we have looked at here, both sodium as well as in uh, potassium. And you'll go through the same types of things that I just showed you diagrammatically. Um, I asked you earlier on, on Monday, uh, sorry, Wednesday, um, I don't think many of you were actually doing uh, electrical recording, right? There was like one individual. Is that same person still here? No? Um, would any of you like to do some electrophys recording, like at least give it a shot, maybe try it once or twice? I don't know if you do that in your labs at all. Um, but uh, if, if you have the opportunity, let me know um, sometime in the next um, few days and um, we'll, we'll head down uh, down the hallway a little bit to my old lab um, and I'll ask my uh, old supervisor whether or not you can do some patch recording uh, as well. There are two different modes. When we do electrophysiology, because of that relationship that we looked at, um, Ohm's law, V equals IR, we can do two different things. We can manipulate both voltage and we can manipulate current. We cannot change the biophysical properties of the cell. We can't alter resistance, but we can alter things like um, the current as well as the voltage. And so when we do the recordings, and this is going to be important when we get into the active properties of the cell, when we go in and we start doing current clamp or voltage clamp, it's important to make sure that you know the difference between them. 
in current clamp mode, we still have an electrode and we still are inject, uh, we still are inserting it into a neuron. You control, uh, the experimenter controls the current that gets injected into the neuron. You can do that by putting in positive ions or you can do this in a number of different ways. And, and you measure the output. You measure what happens to the membrane potential as you inject current. So you can inject positive current and watch whether or not you uh, reach threshold and cause the firing of action potentials. So I've already shown you current clamp when we looked at the interneuron as well as the pyramidal cell. In voltage clamp mode, it's very similar in terms of the idea behind it, but here you control the neuron's uh, membrane potential and you measure the currents that result as a, as a result of um, holding or changing the membrane potential of the neuron. So you could take and step um, in these uh, really defined um, voltage steps um, to different levels. Like you can depolarize, you can hyperpolarize, and you can measure the um, currents that result from these changes in voltage, okay? What do you think that tells you information about? Tells you no information at all. Obviously, it must tell you something. What do you think it tells you about? A little bit, well, it does definitely tell you about resistance. And resistance is also a function of, of, of what um, crosses the membrane and everything else, but it tells you about what types of um, channels you have in that particular um, patch of membrane. So here is an example of current clamp mode. And in current clamp mode, one of the things that you do is you do these um, step polarization, uh, hyperpolarizations in this case. So we have a stimulus current and we are measuring the membrane potential. So we are in current clamp, we are causing a um, step hyperpolarization. So we go more and more hyperpolarized and we are looking at what happens here. And the shape now of the hyperpolarizing response that is generated from each of these currents is again a property of the membrane resistance as well as the capacitance. Is that okay for everyone? Is it just because it's Friday? Is it, should I start wearing a different color tie? Maybe, I'm not sure. Um, ho hopefully you will see that both of these responses are linear, right? So as you increase, increase the current, you will al also increase the change in potential that you see. Exactly as you would expect, it's a linear relationship between voltage and current through Ohm's law. And on these um, particular um, uh, neurons that we're looking at, it is, a, it is a linear response. So the bigger that we make the hyperpolarizing current, the bigger the hyperpolarizing membrane potential change that we see. And we see that it's a nice linear response on both, as we would expect. Okay, folks, um, I'm hoping you had a nice little... Uh, sidetrack a uh, little trip out there and um, now that we're back kind of like recess exactly um, so we'll just go through this and we'll go through as many slides as we can um, if if uh, if we can we'll still try to finish a little bit early but obviously with the 10 minute uh, break that we just had there unexpectedly we'll, we might be a little bit behind what I was hoping to get through um, we can do exactly the same thing in these neurons. We had previously, just before we had all that excitement, gone through hyperpolarizations where you could see a linear response between voltage and current. So we inject current, we measure the voltage, and we see that it's linear. It's, a, uh, it's getting consistently bigger and it's um, not changing in any way. And we can do exactly the same thing with depolarization. We're still in current clamp mode, so we are injecting current. In this case, depolarizing current, it's moving closer towards zero. And we can see exactly the same thing in the membrane uh, potential as well here. Is that okay for everyone? Yes? Okay, perfect. Now, this is a passive property. It's a property of the membrane and everything else. You can see that the resistance capacitance causes a shape change in the membrane potential. And when we reach a certain threshold value, if we depolarize enough by injecting enough current, we will be able to generate this. And this is a, an action potential, obviously. Here, the, the rules are no longer applicable. This is no longer a passive property of the membrane. This is different. This is a generation of an action potential. It's no longer linear. The voltage um, potential 
um, and the uh, current no longer are in a linear fashion because as we've increased the current here, we have generated a much different looking potential and this potential actually hyperpolarizes. It's no longer a linear response. Therefore, when we reach threshold values, the rules that have applied to the passive properties of the membrane no longer apply in this particular case, okay? And then we get into the active properties of the membrane, which involve uh, this action potential. So as far as we know, um, the action potential is used uh, in any of the, or all of the different animal nervous systems for high speed, long distance signaling. We, we need to be able to encode information this way. Most of the material was, um, uh, actually figured out by Hodgkin and Huxley and they won the Nobel Prize for this using the same sorts of voltage clamp techniques and we'll go through some of those voltage clamp techniques in a few moment in its most basic form which is why we started the whole discussion today on the Hodgkin uh, sorry the Goldman equation the action potential derives from the uh, the um, the relationship between two different ions, sodium as well as potassium. And when we are no longer talking about leak potentials or leak currents, now we are talking about voltage gated um, channels, the, the rules no longer apply. Passive properties are always properties of leak channels and only leak channels and the basic properties of the membrane. Active properties, um, are decided by these voltage dependent or voltage gated sodium and voltage gated potassium channels. As most of you know, this is a one of the rare forms of positive feedback in the physiology um, system. Um, this is a voltage gated sodium channel. So wh wherever we get this depolarization from, in the previous diagrams, I've showed you that we can manipulate the system using current clamp. We depolarize by injecting um, positive current, but you can also do this in a physiological condition by get, gaining synaptic stimulation. So you directly stimulate a presynaptic neuron that causes this to occur. But overall, it's a uh, positive feedback mechanism where sodium channels activate and um, cause more sodium ions to rush in, more depolarization occurs. Because it's voltage dependent, more sodium channels open up because depolarization has occurred and, it, and this causes more depolarization. And so this is a positive feedback loop, right? And you guys all remember that from your earlier PSL lectures. Yes? Perfect. Um, of course, one of the things that happens, it just doesn't keep going forever. The other thing that is important in this is that um, the voltage gated sodium channel also inactivates. It doesn't always stay open. It's not a continuous positive feedback mechanism. In addition to that, we also have embedded in that same membrane, voltage gated potassium channels. And these voltage gated potassium channels start to get activated by depolarization as well. So while sodium is, is causing its own channels to become activated, it will also start to activate through depolarization the voltage gated potassium channels as well. And they have a slower activation time that I'll show you in a cartoon fashion in about two or three slides. Um, by the time that these potassium channels are open, the driving force on potassium is very high. And that, that means that you're going to see the net movement of potassium um, to cause the repolarization of the membrane. Do you guys remember that equation for driving force at all? Do you know what sorts of things um, make up driving force? You'll have to know it for your midterm. You'll have to know it for your um, upcoming um, computer simulation. Do you remember any of it? What What is it the difference between? The equilibrium reversal potential for the ion um, subtracted from the resting membrane potential. Okay, so you always have to um, look at the driving force for what ions are moving in and out, and we'll look at that mathematically at the very end. So overall, if we're to take a look at the different um, sections of an action potential where the passive properties no longer occur, it is no longer the passive movement through open channels or leak channels that is causing a change in the membrane potential. It is now voltage dependent um, changes. The membrane will de depolarize up to threshold. This is where those, those voltage uh, dependent sodium channels open up. And as they do, they cause that positive feedback cycle. And as they start to inactivate, the voltage dependent potassium channels open, which cause this um, hyperpolarizing or repolarizing uh, phase in number three. Um, in addition to that, 
Uh, I don't know if you guys still learn this or not in any of your uh, lectures, but there's also calcium entry as well. So there's calcium entry through voltage-gated calcium channels, which activates a an after-polarizing uh, potassium-dependent uh, current as well. And do you guys learn about that in your third-year courses still? No, no longer? Okay, so this undershoot, it's not found in every neuron. In some neurons, there is also this after hyperpolarization where it actually goes below the original resting membrane potential, and that's typically due to this calcium-dependent mechanism, um, and that also is dependent on uh, voltage um, initially. You will do this exercise several times in your um, simulations next week. You will be asked on your midterm to recapitulate parts of this, like what would you expect to, to see? Um, both in terms of the overall magnitude, the size of um, your response, as well as the duration of your response as well. So just like the resting membrane potential um, that was found by Bernstein, uh, was found to be dependent on potassium. The action potential is totally dependent on the um, concentration of extracellular sodium. And we know this as well from Hodgkin Huxley and other um, individuals, that if we were able to show a normal action potential, we could do this in current clamp mode, we could depolarize the neuron that we're looking at, and we cause this action potential to be generated, and we did a fusion experiment similar to what Bernstein did earlier on, and changed the level of the sodium extracellularly, we would see that we would still get this um, depolarization, but it wouldn't be at the same level that we saw earlier. So lower levels of sodium actually change the overall magnitude of the action potential response. So how do you know that while you're recording from this neuron that it's not something that has happened to the neuron? How do you know that the neuron is still able to respond in a normal way? Which is why in current clamp mode, we would actually go back to the same um, sorts of conditions that cause the original action potential and see that we get recovery. So this might actually be due to the fact that the neuron is dying, right? So your neuron is no longer healthy, it's no longer responsive, but if you can show that when you go back to the initial conditions, so you get recovery, then you know that it's due solely to the um, lowered sodium um, concentration. Is that okay for everyone? So this control is actually fairly important as well. So again, you'll do this exact same experiment. You will get this normal looking response by looking at the normal level of extracellular sodium or Na um, outside. And then by changing it to 30% um, less or 70% of the total that you had originally, you would see that you had changes in the overall size or amplitude of your um, action potential. At a certain point, you're no longer going to be able to get an action potential, which is one of the um, things that you will start looking at in next week's um, uh, computer simulations. But you can see that there are changes and changes in the shape and duration of the um, action potential by changing the level of sodium as well using this current clamp mode. Again, just to show you exactly the same thing, two important points for us to take a look at. I showed you this figure here at the bottom initially um, as a passive property. If we were only looking at leak channels, what we would see is that with changes in the extracellular sodium, and we're not injecting current, we're not in current clamp mode, all we're doing is changing extracellular sodium, we wouldn't see a very big change in the membrane potential. It doesn't depolarize. There are no leak channels or very few leak channels um, for sodium to be acting on. However, if we were to look at the active properties of the same neuron, we would see that with depolarization and activation of the active properties, the active voltage dependent sodium channels, we would see that it is very much dependent on the extracellular sodium um, concentrations. Okay, So you, you have to keep both of these distinct, separate, and understandable for you. So one is a leak channel down here, and up here at the top, the voltage-dependent channel is very dependent on the driving force, the, um, the, the overall concentration that is found outside of the, um, of the neuron. And you can see that if you go back and you calculate the slope, do you, do you remember where the uh, 58 value sort of comes into play, or do you remember that value from the last lecture at all? 
it's close to what? So it's close to 60, which is the equilibrium potential for, for sodium. And so this, again, was another form of proof that Hodgkin and Huxley were able to derive that um, it was really the sodium uh, channel, it was really sodium that was causing the action potential rising phase. So um, this is the last sort of uh, leak channel passive property that we looked at in the last uh, lecture. And this is a leak channel. If nothing else, if by looking at the passive properties, we would see this linear response um, in the uh, membrane potential as we change the current. We would see this linear response that has a reversal potential at about 60 millivolts. And this is the leak channel, only the leak channel. If we were to look at the voltage-gated sodium channel, this is what it would look like. The voltage-gated sodium channel actually has a similar part on the slope of um, the uh, voltage current relationship, but at lower um, membrane potentials, you would actually see that you get no movement, no current being generated. Okay, and again, just as a form of convention, um, this is where uh, current is flowing in, and as we start to depolarize um, the cell, uh, the cell membrane, we would start to open up this channel, sodium would start to flow in, and then right at its reversal potential, there is no net movement of sodium in or out. And then as we um, start to depolar, if we were to start injecting more and more current, we would actually start to see through this open channel, we'd actually see sodium leaving the cell and flowing out of the cell. So it has exactly the same uh, uh, portion of the IV curve, but because of its inactivation and because it's closed at um, uh, lower uh, membrane potentials, this is why it has a very different shape. It is not a leak current, which is what you would see um, here if it was a linear response. And if you mapped it out, it would look exactly like this. The potassium current is very similar. Um, in some regards. So the potassium leak current looks like this. The reversal potential is here, or the equilibrium potential for potassium is down here. Uh, again, similar concept. And if you were to go through and do the IV curve for potassium, because it's a voltage-gated channel as well, you would actually start to see um, a slightly different looking curve. It does line up on certain parts of it, but because you have to activate the and open the channel, it has a very different looking response, okay? So again, the blue represents an active voltage dependent process. The red represents a passive leak channel, and they're similar because you're using the same ion and you're going through a channel, but they're not all the same because in some cases you have to activate or open the channel first. So um, I'm going to take you through uh, the voltage clamp in the next couple of um, slides. And this becomes important because voltage clamp actually allows us to go back and dissect out this action potential in more, in more detail. A couple of really important reminders about the conventions for voltage clamp. So when we look at um, IV relationships or current voltage relationships, the currents that are um, shown below a certain line are going to be inward, and I'll show you that on the next diagram. And positive charge by convention flows into the neurons, and currents shown above a line are where they are flowing out of a cell, and these positive charges flow out of the neuron. So if we go in, and now, instead of injecting current, what we do is we take this cell, or this neuron, and we put an electrode on it, and we uh, quickly ramp the membrane potential, and we have a rheostat that allows us to make sure that it goes exactly to zero millivolts, and we take it and hold the membrane potential at zero millivolts. This is voltage clamp mode. We are, we are manipulating the voltage, and we are measuring the resulting current. Is that clear for everyone? So if you're asked to draw this again and you're asked to draw in voltage clamp mode, you would always show that you are manipulating the membrane potential and you would draw out the resulting currents that would come about. And so when you do this and you are doing this on a cell, what you would see is that in this mode and if you are only measuring total current, you don't really know what you're measuring but you're looking at the current flow, initially in the first few milliseconds you would see an inward current. Okay, so this by definition is going down, current is flowing in, okay? Then 
after a certain amount of time, while the, cell, while the neuron is still depolarized, then you would start to see current actually flowing out. It wasn't until later that um, people were able to dissect out what was going on. What, what was this weird looking current? All you could do was cause voltage clamp, um, and when you voltage clamped, you would see an inward current and an outward current. Was it all due to one channel? Was it due to multiple channels? It wasn't until pharmacology came along and you were able to find very, very specific pharmacological toxins that you were able to dissect both of these things out. So I'll, I'll start off at the top and it becomes um, important. There is a, um, a particular toxin that you can use, TEA. Um, tetraethyl ammonium that you can apply to your cultures and one of the things that it does it is very very specific for uh, the voltage dependent not the lead channel but the voltage dependent potassium channel when you are doing the same voltage clamp experiment in the presence of this very specific voltage dependent potassium channel blocker all you saw was an inward current okay so you knew, like they, they had known from other studies that this was very specific to a voltage dependent potassium. It blocks all voltage dependent potassium. This was the initial curve when you now did the same experiment and all you did was add TEA. This was the type of curve that you saw. Does that tell you anything? So it tells you that there are probably two different components to this um, init initial current that you saw earlier. Again, those same, those same um, scientists were also able to derive a toxin from pufferfish known as TTX or tetrodotoxin. And tetrodotoxin is unlike TEA in that it is a specific blocker, an irreversible blocker for um, sodium channels. And so when you add tetrodotoxin and you do this voltage clamp, instead of seeing this type of curve that you saw initially, you saw this type of uh, response where you saw this type of current. So tell me a couple of things just to make sure that you are um, able to follow things along. Um, in If you add tetrodotoxin, will you see an inward or an outward current? So on this deflection, because it is above zero, it is by definition and convention an outward current. You're, you're absolutely right. Tetrodotoxin blocks sodium. By using both types of um, pharmacological inhibitors, what you were able to show was that the early response, the inward response, the inward current was actually due to an inflow of sodium because the sodium channel, when you block it, you don't see this influx. The later response that you saw um, that uh, Hodgkin and Huxley were able to show was due to potassium moving out of the cell. Is that okay for everyone? So knowing these two different toxins is important and knowing how to um, interpret these different types of IV responses in voltage clamp mode is also important. Do you have any questions before going on? So if you follow all of that along, what, what, would, what would your response be if I added both TTX and TEA in voltage clamp mode up to zero millivolts? Nothing, right? So both channels are blocked, no response whatsoever. So this underlies how we know about sodium being involved early in that um, positive feedback loop, as well as potassium being involved later. So if we did that whole thing on a molecular level, here we have uh, a neuron, um, and tell me what, what type of mode am I in here? Am I in voltage or am I in current clamp mode? And you have to look at what I'm manipulating here on the side. I'm in voltage clamp mode, I'm manipulating voltage, that's right, so I'm measuring membrane potential or voltage. You can always tell because you see voltage, either millivolts or whatever on the side here, and I am uh, clamping it, clamping the voltage at zero uh, or at about uh, 50, and what I'm looking at is the response of sodium. So sodium is the early response, and what I see later is the potassium response. And again, I won't go through all of the inactivation, et cetera, that, that was on the previous slide. Is that okay for everyone? So all of these types of experiments are done using what's known as whole cell recording. And again, it's a very uh, useful type of recording technique. And one of the things that you do is you take a pipette, an electric 
uh, sorry, a glass electrode recording pipette, um, and you go and touch a neuron, and as you touch the neuronal membrane, it will create a, um, a, uh, a little indentation in the membrane, and then you can actually cause this membrane to adhere to the inner side of the recording pipette. In other words, you are creating a tight seal. It's what's known as a mega-ohm seal. There's nothing that can go through it. Remember, ions can't pass through the biophysical uh, phospholipid bilayer, and by creating this really high-resistance mega-ohm or giga-ohm seal, um, elect um, ions can only flow uh, through the pipette or through open channels. There's no other way for them to leak out through the sides, for example. Is that clear for everyone? How do I um, create this mild suction, by the way? This is where having that person that actually did um, recording is useful. With your mouth? <laughs> you, you suck it with your mouth. So you, you, go, you go right up to... Um, you go right up to uh, the neuron and you kind of give it a, you suck on the pipette. So this is a really small pipette. You're, you're right, I'm just teasing you. Um, thank you for being really polite. The, a couple of years ago when I taught this course, um, one of the responses, and someone who actually did um, re electrophys recording, uh, when I asked, um, they just shut it out, suck it. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> what, what nice class. Um, so. Yes, you're absolutely right there. You actually suction this out. It's connected by a tube, and it doesn't take a lot of pressure to be able to do this. This is useful because you can actually have free access to the cytoplasm of the um, cell, the neuron that you're recording from. Can you tell me, based on what I've, yeah. Yeah. There, there are a lot of reasons. One is this right here. So with a sharp pipette, for example, you really can't create one, a giga-ohm seal. So for example, if I were trying to introduce something into the cell, if it's not a giga-ohm seal, in theory, instead of going in this direction, it could actually leak out to the sides, right? I'd never be able to tell if I'm getting 100% um, of the cell, all the channels on the cell, etc. What do you think is going on down here at the bottom, based on what I've just told you? Like if you can put together the story, sorry? You're injecting a dye, that's right. You can actually put a dye or whatever else you want into your recording pipette, your glass electrode, and as you're doing the recording, you can actually pressure eject, um, kind of like blowing out, instead of sucking in, blowing out into the neuron, and it will completely fill your neuron because your pipette actually becomes continuous with the cytoplasm of the neuron you're recording from. So you can actually go back in, do all the recordings, fill that neuron with a uh, dye as your uh, colleague has mentioned, and then you can go back and look for particular proteins in that same cell that you recorded from. And it's a very um, great technique to be able to make use of. And this is sort of what was on those previous diagrams. When we talked about that IV relationship, when we talked about recording and that initial um, biphasic response, this was that whole cell uh, or cell attached recording um, configuration that they were using to generate that um, uh, the voltage clamp um, uh, type of result. However, there's this more sophisticated technique that you can actually do. In some cases, you can do things exactly the same way. You go in, you touch the um, neuronal membrane, you create suction, you create this giga-ohm seal, but instead of stopping there, you retract the pipette. You retract the electrode. And by retracting the pipette back just a little bit, you actually rip apart a little bit of the membrane, as is shown in this diagram. By doing so, because of the properties of the biophysical membrane or the phospholipid bilayer, one of the things that it wants to do is to self-anneal. It wants to actually repair itself. It's like having a puncture in a tire that seals itself. And what it does is the two ends will actually anneal together and create an impermeable phospholipid bilayer again. And if you're really lucky and you happen to be um, incredibly lucky, you will have some of the channels stuck into that patch of membrane that you've just pulled away. Okay, And this con particular configuration is known as an outside-out recording. What do, you, what do you think that configuration means, outside-out? What does that mean? Yes. Um, 
Okay, exactly so. So the extracellular regions that of uh, receptors, channels that were found on the extracellular region are now on the outside of your patch uh, and are exposed to the external environment. You're exactly right. So this allows us to control things inside the cell. So I could put different ionic concentrations here and I can control the bath conditions as well. So it's a very precise level of control on the ionic um, concentrations that we can find inside and outside the cell. In addition, we can do exactly the same types of experiments that we did previously. We can still do voltage clamp. We can still do current clamp on this little patch of membrane. Okay, is that okay for everyone? Not okay for everyone? Is there something I need to um, tell you some more about, or you guys are okay? <laughs> you guys are going to be like that. Okay, that's fine. No worries. I'll assume that it's okay. If you have questions, um, let me know. I'll be happy to try to answer them for you. So again, just to be clear, uh, what kind of um, mode am I in? Am I in voltage or current clamp on both diagrams at the top? So we're in voltage clamp mode. So I am holding voltage here in this case. Um, let's just say it's close to 50. And in this case, it's at, uh, uh, sorry, close to uh, zero. And in this case, it's close to 50. So when I start to depolarize the resting membrane potential towards zero, I am causing it to reach threshold, in other words. When I'm reaching threshold, I am activating what type of channels? So voltage-gated sodium channels are the first to activate. And if you're taking a look at the different um, uh, uh, recordings that you see down here, there are about seven different sweeps that are being shown here. Um, and as you take a look, you will actually see that in this particular case, this there was a, a, a particular event here. Was there a movement of ions into or out of the cell? So this again is um, into inwards. So this is an inward current. Um, and in this particular sweep, there was also an inward current. And you can see that overall, do these channels open for long periods of time or they open for short periods of time? So relatively speaking, they open and close uh, quickly. And so this is what you're seeing here. If you take a composite of many, many of these sweeps, when you start your initial depolarization, you will see that there is an initial inward current, but it doesn't last very long. It inactivates itself, which is exactly what the sodium channel or voltage dependent sodium channel does. So there's an initial inward current due to sodium, and then it inactivates and it gets turned off. And we can, and we're doing this now in this outside out patch where we're not looking at many, many channels at a time. We're looking at single channels at a time. Is that clear for everyone? And we're looking at single channels and this is the type of response you would see in single channels. So let's do the same experiment again and now do this uh, with another voltage clamp. And by doing this, one of the things that we see in the same patch or in a different patch, again, it doesn't matter, um, by doing this type of experiment, we would see this type of response. So um, again, is it inward or outward? So this is an outward uh, movement of ions and it's above zero. And so what we would see is that if we took a composite of all of these, we would see that during the duration of this depolarization um, in voltage clamp mode, and we continually depolarized that we would see this type of response. It is a sustained response that we see um, in this particular case. So this is the way in which we use voltage clamp mode in these outside, outside patches to tell us a lot about the kinetics as well as confirm some of the um, initial exper experiments in the whole cell uh, patch method that we saw earlier on as well. Okay, so again, just, um, just to reiterate, current clamp and voltage clamp are a little bit different. Now that you've seen both, um, you know what to uh, look for. Uh, in one case, in current clamp, you are um, injecting positive current. In voltage clamp, you are controlling and maintaining uh, a certain membrane potential. And again, be very clear on that. Um, so if it's okay with you, I'm just going to go through one part of the question with you. Most of the... Um, uh, answers are actually uh, solved for you. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of things for you to practice as well as go through um, some of them really quickly. Is that okay for everyone? Um, do you have any questions before I go on? Like anything at all? Would you be able to recapitulate some of those experiments on your midterm? Maybe. 
Yes. Okay. Did you guys get a copy of um, the midterm from last year? It's on Blackboard. Have you tried last year's midterm? When, when will you try last year's midterm? Okay. Uh, when before the midterm? <laughs> okay. Ne never let it be said that uh, physiology students do not have a fantastic sense of humor. I I'm hoping that um, if you have any questions about uh, last, year mid uh, last year's midterm, um, I'll be using that sort of as a template. Some of the questions will be somewhat similar. Some will be a little bit different. Um, my intention is to give you as much practice related to what you'll see on this year's midterm as possible. The following is an example of a question that's similar to what you had on last year's midterm, which you'll get in your um, upcoming uh, computer simulation, as well as what you will see on your uh, midterm in uh, later on in February. So you will get a question very similar to this. It's important that you are able to synthesize all the concepts that we've talked about on Wednesday as well as um, on today. And you will likely be able to uh, use a non-programmable calculator. Can't use a programmable calculator, but a non-programmable programmable one would be okay. You can always go back because we will give you the ratios just in case you don't have a programmable calculator, you forgot it at home, etc. cetera. Um, you'll always be able to use, um, the ratio will be given for you and uh, you'll be able to plug some of that in because you, we will give you some of the values for the different equations, okay? So you should be able to do these types of equations like in your sleep, to be quite honest. You should be able to calculate the driving force. So you need to know the definition of the driving force at of, on each ion at a particular uh, membrane potential. So you need to know, and I asked you earlier on, you were able to tell me what the driving force was. It's the difference between the membrane potential and the equilibrium potential for that particular ion. Do you know what the equilibrium potential for this particular ion is here? You would have to calculate it in this case, right? So you'd have to know how to plug in these values in order to get the equilibrium potential. After you've got the equilibrium potential, you would have to go back in and plug that in to get the driving force for each particular um, ion. And for some of these, there is actually a range. So it goes from 5 to 15. You would actually have to check what the driving force is when it's 5 versus what the driving force is when it is 15. Um, does the driving force change at the higher and lower end of the range? And you'll be asked that. Um, this is usually one of the first questions because we uh, – You'll know ahead of time that you're going to be asked this type of question. You'll plug in different numbers. There might be some uh, subtle changes to this, but this is a, a fundamental aspect of knowing um, uh, um, electrophysiology in the physiology department. Um, even, even though I didn't do a lot of it when I was in, in uh, the master's program here in, in physiology, I was still asked this on my thesis exam, and I had to sit there and actually calculate it out because Dr. Charlton had asked, like, you know, if you're in physiology, by the time you graduate uh, from our program, you have to be able to tell me like what the driving force on this ion is. So I think it's important. Make sure that you spend the time um, going through uh, this particular example. Um, so you would, again, be able to make the assumption that it's at 27 degrees. You wouldn't have to go through and do all of the... Um, uh, sort of uh, background on this. You can simply jump in and say that if we assume it's at 27, you can plug into this equation and you would have to know how this equation might change, for example, for chloride and how it would change for potassium. You'd be able to plug in these numbers exactly as we're doing here using the extracellular and intracellular concentrations that are provided for you. In this case, there is no gradient. It's only one. Um, and so you would have this particular log and it would be like minus 84 would be the equilibrium potential or reversal potential um, for potassium. For sodium, you're given a range, so you'd have to calculate the range that's available for you from 84 all the way down to 60 millivolts. Obviously, the driving force is going to be different between 84 and 60. Um, you would have to know how to calculate that. And most of it is really brute force, just sitting there um, calculating all of these. The, uh, again, just to draw your attention to the fact that chloride is different. It has a charge of minus one, um, and so we can also um, take that into account here as well when you go through that calculation. Calcium, again, it's divalent. It's a positive um, divalent ion, so you can plug in these numbers as well. If you go, th and you guys have all of the solutions, right? 
Okay, so make sure that you're able to do it. Driving force, um, again, is the difference between the uh, membrane potential that's provided to you, you would have to be given some indication of it, and the calculated value that you've just gone through, and this would represent the total driving force. And you would be able to tell if it's moving inward or moving outward. In the worst case scenario, you could always go in and see relative to this curve that you were um, having, if it was like a leak conductance, if it would be moving out of the cell or into the cell. Okay. Uh, same thing for sodium, um, for chloride, as well as calcium. I'll leave that to you to, uh, make, uh, to make sure that you go over during the weekend. Um, again, you can always draw out these values to see if it's moving inward or outward relative to these and what the overall changes are. Um, in terms of the driving force and whether or not things are still moving in or out of the cell. And for chloride, it's a, a little bit different, again, because it's a negative um, anion, you have to flip things around. But again, if you do this enough times, it becomes um, fairly easy to do this. Um, yeah? How do you know which ion has the greatest driving force? You'd actually have to go back in and calculate that relative to the equilibrium potentials depending on the concentration gradients that they all have. Okay? Yes? In that case, I guess it's the magnitude or just the most positive value? Um, the biggest value. The one that has the, the biggest absolute value. So which one is moving, which one has the greatest um, driving force, which one would have the, the greatest um, difference in terms of moving? Okay, so um, just one thing. One of those questions actually asked, if, if all of these ions that were provided to you had equal contributions, how would you go back in and calculate the uh, resting membrane potential based on this? So there are two different ways to, to tackle this. The one way to do this is simply um, go in and realize that if they all have equal contributions, each one is equally likely to have the same sort of conductance that it would, they would all sort of have the same value of about 0.25 of, of one or a quarter of the value, right? So be 0.25 times the equilibrium uh, potential that you just calculated. Same thing for um, calcium. The total conductance would be one here. And again, this is based on the relative values. You would have to be able to calculate the resting membrane potential from the relative contributions. All channels are open. All channels contribute equally. This would be the answer that you would be able to derive. Okay. Give that a shot. See if you can uh, come up with the same answer. If all of them were open, these are all passive uh, properties. And when the absolute conductances are given, so if you are provided with um, the absolute conductance of sodium at um, 10 to the minus 6 Siemens, or for chloride, 3 times 10 to the 6 uh, Siemens, um, you can do this in a number of ways. You could actually plug in these numbers, or um, in most cases, because the total conductance is usually going to add up to 1 anyways, and we round it up so that it um, gives you a total conductance of 1, you can realize that... Uh, 1 plus 3 plus 6 is equal to 10. And so the overall contribution is like 0.1 out of 10, uh, 0.3 out of 10, um, or 0.6 out of 1, sorry. And then all of these equal 1 in total, right? We only are looking at the total conductance due to these three ions. All of them should add up to 1. I'll never give you a, a scenario where it doesn't equal 1. Okay? Does that make some sense to you? Okay, I'm hoping you practice. Please practice. I, I promise as long as you um, have gone through and tried some of these questions, like the midterm will not be um, bad in terms of um, any surprises that way, but you do have to know like how to use these equations. You have to know how to calculate that um, Nernst equation, and the simplest way to do it is by simply going through and doing these calculations. The last things that I'll leave you with and these will be important for the, um, for the uh, midterm as well. Do you guys have this as well in your handouts? You do? So I want you to think a little bit about this. So um, this will become important when you go into the, um, into the computer simulations in the, ne in the next, uh, in, uh, next Friday. Um, does a synaptic current always produce a similar change in membrane potential? 
again, you'll have to, by that time, you should have a firm answer. You should be able to test that answer um, on Friday. And these will be similar types of questions that you'll see on the midterm as well, okay? Do you have any questions before we sort of wrap things up? No? Are you guys looking forward to the weekend? Is it when you're catching up on all your work or when you're getting rest? Sleep. Okay, good Good plan. Um, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll certainly uh, be available for the next little while. Uh, please practice these questions. Uh, I will post other questions for you as well. And if you ever want to take them up, let me know and I'll be happy to do so.